in the palm of her outstretched hand, Jerusalem seems to offer almost too much. Yet once a week, pleasure seekers leave their city and take to the single avenue of escape, westwards. For the first time in 3,000 years, this exodus is one of choice. pleasures of the Western world may be physically removed from the boundaries of Jerusalem, yet the 20th century children of Israel carry their city with them, be it the few kilometers to Tel Aviv or the thousands of miles to another continent. that's been called Canaan, Palestine, and Israel. Jerusalem, a city that's always been much more than simply a capital, was one of the oldest cities in the world. It's been invaded and conquered, destroyed and rebuilt by a triumphant succession of emperors and kings, the Jews. Jerusalem has always been the holiest place on earth, the foundation stone of their religion, the focus of their prayers. But in the first century, the Roman Empire exiled them. For 19 centuries, they were absent, gazing from afar with longing at their lands, praying daily for their return to Jerusalem. Not without bloodshed, the Jews returned to rebuild their country, revitalize their city. First, Jerusalem will appear to offer contradictions. Where is the city built by David, reigned over by Solomon, fought for by Alexander? Is this truly the city Jesus wept for? The city from which Muhammad ascended to the next world? Jerusalem, the very name invokes pictures of days that can never be forgotten. Jerusalem is history. There are 5,000 years behind her, with as many stories of blockade and siege, capture and redemption. There are the writings of Ezra, Nehemiah and Josephus. There are clues to her past uncovered by the plow and the rain and the building contractor's dynamite. And then there's the spirit of Jerusalem, carried by generations in exile. The long shadow of antiquity casts no sleepy idleness across the holy city. The rubble of 2,000 indifferent years is cleared by the enthusiasm of Jerusalem's youth. They are reshaping and molding their city in the character of the Judean hills to meet the demands of a nuclear age. But they're not destroyers. They do not seek to remove the foundations of their city, merely to strengthen them. Amidst a world designed with the slide rule and built with computers, another world. Robed men and veiled women walk in a city of cobbled streets where the only traffic is four-legged. This is a world the West almost forgot, a world that stopped a thousand years ago. 
Jerusalem has none of the big city anonymity that is to be found in most capitals. Instead, in this multicolored melting pot, there's the atmosphere of a small provincial market town. And here, every face in the rush hour crowd stands out, each with an identity, each with a story to tell. Today, the city elders must build for the year 2000 and beyond. In Judean stone and breeze block, they build for the stream of immigrants who have come home. The bricklayer's trowel helps to cement the unity of a people who, for so long, were scattered to the wind. But never far away are architectural contradictions, rickety balconies perched on the precarious heights of sturdy walls, they boast of architects like Suleiman, whilst they gaze with mocking eyes across the rooftops to modernity. From this unlikely landmark, the new Jerusalem has grown. The seeds were sown just a hundred years ago when an English Jew, Sir Moses Montefiore, created this housing settlement. It took men like Montefiore and Theodor Herzl to fire the imagination of a scattered people. But in their ones and twos, from over 70 different countries, they began to come home. Carrying their customs with them, from Eastern Europe came Orthodox Jews in their astrakhan hats and long kaftans. They seem out of place in the hot noonday sun, but Mia Sharim and its people are very much a part of Jerusalem, Israel, and Judaism. They are rabbis and scholars and students. Their days are spent in study and prayer. Religion is their life. The Western Wall is all that remains of the Hebrews' holiest of places. The splendor of kings like Solomon and Herod has long been destroyed. But the faith for which the great temples were built survives. <laughs> As a divided city, Jerusalem's Jews were denied their rights to pray at these ancient walls. But now, the vow repeated on feast days for 1900 years has been fulfilled. Next year, in Jerusalem. The Jerusalemite lives with history, but the history which surrounds him has been fought for and lost so many times that he can never take it for granted. He's as much a pilgrim as those who come from afar, and just as eagerly he joins the multitudes who queue for a glimpse of King Herod's tomb. Or he might go beyond Bethlehem, across the barren Judean wilderness, to climb the fortress built by nature, dressed by the extrovert, Herod, Masada,
here in the first century, 900 of Jerusalem's Jews committed mass suicide after years of resistance, rather than face submission to the conquering Roman legions. Today, Masada is a symbol of that resistance, which has preserved the identity of a nation. The centuries have washed nothing away. The Israelis, who today lounge in the Mediterranean sunshine, have within them that same defiance which for years baffled the mighty Roman Empire. Jesus of Nazareth rode through streets paved with palms, listening to the roar of the approving crowds. A few days later, he was to die in the city he loved. His followers wrote about him and fought wars over him. Most of all, they built for him. Above the Garden of Gethsemane, the splendor of the Tsars now dominates the once barren Mount of Olives. A thousand years ago, Richard the Lionheart was building churches between his battles with Saladin. <laughs> now, the inheritors sip beer and talk politics amongst the tombs of the Crusaders. <laughs> there are those who still can't believe their good fortune. Born in ghettos, pushed from persecution to persecution, the day suddenly dawned when they woke up in the only land which is home. But for them, their ancient land still has the excitement of a new possession. The nomadic Bedouin still roams the Judean hills, looking on Jerusalem with shaded eyes, rarely venturing into the world he does not understand. Yet into his hands came a treasure that had no place in his world. Written centuries before the time of Jesus, the Dead Sea Scrolls are now preserved in an honored place within Jerusalem's museum. Never far away is the Mediterranean Sea. But for those who fought to regain their lands and their city, this is much more than simply a seaside resort. The sea holds many memories for those who return to rebuild a nation.
in the quiet of the military cemetery, Jerusalem's children are told the story of war. To them all, it's a familiar story. Few of them have not lost a relative in battle. All have heard the sound of shellfire. But for them to understand their inheritance, they must count the cost. Tomorrow, they'll work and rule their state. To a forest just outside Jerusalem, a child may be taken by his parents to picnic in the shade of one of the six million trees that have been planted. For each tree represents the life of a Jew who perished needlessly in the Second World War. With each graduation from the Hebrew University, Jerusalem is strengthened it's a different strength from that which kept the city alive for 3,000 years, a different strength from that which wars have failed to destroy. It's a strength desperately required in a fiercely competitive world. Occasionally, though, the university will offer contradictions. The irony of a Bedouin who studied for a degree and on graduation returned to his flocks in the nearby desert. In a city with so much to offer, there can be no focal point. It's like a vast shop window for the three great religions. But because of its distinctly beautiful architecture, Islam's Mosque of Omar may seem to dominate. To the Arab world, this is the third most holy place on earth, for it was from here that the Prophet Muhammad rose on his spiritual journey to heaven. Not content with desk-bound administration, the mayor of Jerusalem moves through his people, balancing creed and color with an informality that only the young state of Israel can produce. Terry Colic will settle a labor dispute at source and then bargain with a Bedouin over an antique for his museum. He's a Jerusalemite in love with his city, understanding its past and his plans for the future. Gradually, as you learn to live with the city, you begin to understand the mysteries, the contradictions. For the pilgrim, Jerusalem may simply be the sanctuary of three creeds, the focus of his prayers, the holiest place on earth. Oh, <laughs> 
Archaeologists, the city may be a storehouse of history to be rediscovered time and again. But for the Jerusalemite, it's home, his city with its boulevards and back streets where intimate restaurants nudge crowded supermarkets, where football and movies are discussed in cafes and bars. Built on many hills, Jerusalem is a collection of villages, each with a special identity. Like souvenirs, those returning have brought with them the customs of many continents. who translate Yerushalayim as city of peace. But for 19 years, the shadow of a divided city was a grim contradiction. Today, the barbed wire frontier and military installations belong to the past. Only their memory is preserved. Once a year, on the 14th of May, Jerusalem pauses while the sirens wail a lament for the fallen. On the 14th of May, 1948, Israel was reborn from antiquity. It had taken 1,878 years. Today, Jerusalem celebrates that simple declaration of independence. For those who dance through the cool night air of this mountain city, there is not just one Jerusalem, but two. There is the terrestrial city, the capital of Israel, the city of David. And then there is the Jerusalem within us, the city built not with bricks and mortar, but fashioned with our own thoughts and dreams. To the Jerusalemite, the one merges with the other, and has done ever since that warm summer evening in 1948, when a dream became reality. Thank you. 